So it is a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all. Thank you all for coming uh, and to present Innocent Rugaragu, uh, who has multiple bachelor's degrees and two master's degrees and is taking a significant step towards his PhD. Um, so thank you, Innocent. We look thank forward you. to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to continue supporting me through this journey. Uh, it has been a quite a journey, and so I'm happy the journey has been uh, has been good, and so we continue to celebrate this journey together. Um, my topic and my research topic is the leadership for peace and reconciliation in post-violent sub-Saharan African countries' ethical pragmatism, and so that's uh, that's what I've been trying to grapple with. That's what I've been trying to grapple with. And so this topic is personal to me and is purposeful to me. And uh, since you are all my friends, I'm sure you have heard me talk about these topics. And particularly today is a special day for me uh, as a Rwandan. Uh, we had two Rwandans with the, uh, Claudine. Claudine, thank you. So today, that's when the genocide in Rwanda started, uh, April 7th, uh, 23 years ago. And so as we... Uh, celebrate this work. Uh, so right now people in Rwanda, they are commemorating the genocide. So uh, if you don't mind, I'd ask you to stand and let's remember the victims of uh, Rwandan genocide and the other genocides around the globe. They rest in eternal peace. Amen. Thank you. And so um, this is the topic that I ventured out. As you can see, this is sub-Saharan countries. Um, all the countries that are below sub-Sahara desert, that's what I've been trying to grapple with. And particularly, all these countries have been having similar crises as far as the violent conflicts and peace goes. And so that's why I, I thought of staying with these countries. And it's a journey that I'm entering, but also it's a journey that I, I hope and plan to stay in for a long time. So this might be defining my, my career in the years to come. So allow me to... Uh, I'm not going to introduce much my, my committees, but here are the people who have been joining with me and giving me the tools that I needed to be able to speak to you today, giving me the vocabulary, pushing me to make sure that yeah, I'm solid enough to stand on this ground. So we have uh, Susan Aaron, she's my chair. And then you have uh, Sandra Sheridan, she has been uh, um, my second leader, but my mother, my rock, everything, so in between. <laughs> and my dean when I arrived in this school. And then uh, we have Steve Zakaros uh, from the Department of Psychology in the main campus. And Steve has written extensive on leadership and Sandy too. And so they gladly accepted to hold my hand and walk with me. And so since I'm not going to say much about them, uh, their bios are too long to mention here. But for me, this summarizes who they were to me. Uh, in Africa, we say it takes an entire village to raise a child. So that's how they have been to me. And always where the elders see when they are seated, as they are seated, the young folks like me, we can't see there until we stand. And so I'm standing on their shoulders, and they are the giants. And so this is uh, an outline of my dissertation pretty much. So the problem, uh, the statement I have there, the purpose of my study, the theoretical framework, the research question, the research methodology and design, the research questions, the population that I um, uh, engaged, the data collection I did, the findings that I came up with, the significance of my findings to this field, the recommendations, and then the final conclusion, and then a question that uh, pushes me outside this program and this school, so what is next for me? And then I have uh, ample time for interaction with you. Um, and so pretty much this is what really set me up. This is my uh, problem statement. Yeah. Uh, since the mid of last century, Africa has been um, experiencing more violent conflicts, pretty much more than any, any part of the world. And so, and I've been part of that as a Rwandan, but also as an African. And 
And another disturbing fact is that African, one of each lives in Africa has experienced this kind of disruptions um, in his or in her life. And Claudine and I, we, are, we can stand here as the witnesses and other Africans are from Sudan uh, who are here. And uh, I see Father Didas from Rwanda as well, so welcome. And these wars and these violent conflicts in Africa may be peculiar to Africa. Yeah, they have been a little bit persistent in terms of years, uh, how long they last. And more disturbing is that between 1946 and 2002, at least 47 civil wars took place in sub Saharan Africa, the, the part that I'm really interested in. And so, and that generates millions of people dying, uh, like what we, we saw in Rwanda and genocide, where in three months, a million people died, and millions of refugees. And then another problem that I see with my area that I'm trying to address is that um, there's so much poor people in Africa and the, so, and the crisis and we have been doing a lot of soul searching and among the reasons why we undergo this crisis is we have come down pretty much to maybe our leadership. So I've come down to our leadership. And further justification um, is that about um, between the 1960s and 90s, there are about 80 variant change of governments in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's a, that's a state I'm trying to, to address. And so that gives me a little bit more reason why I should, I should focus on this, uh, this area. And then um, many writers have, uh, have again confirmed that the leadership is at the heart of all these calamities and the crises and the problems that we have. And then finally, I'm not trying to blame all the, the, the burdens on the leadership, but also we have had other factors that have contributed to our crises. Uh, we have uh, the pre-colonial history that we had of monarchies that sometimes were unfair. And then we had the colonial history, which was messy. Uh, we had a Cold War. Most of African countries, when they got their independence, are pretty much there. You have you had to pick a side. Either you are with Russia or you are with the Western, Western, Western world. So, uh, so, and then the amount of poverty that we have, amount of ignorance and all that, lack of institutions that could sustain us, lack of internal and external mechanisms to hold our leaders accountable. And uh, so all that has been, been contributing to our crises in Sub-Saharan Africa. But overall, we return to leadership. Uh, if there is a fault line, that fault line, we still feel that it would be a leadership. And so this is part of the problem. Um, a week ago, I was visiting uh, this genocide memorial in Rwanda, just to remind myself to put my studies in the context and, and continue to see if I'm still interested in this area and why I'm interested. And so this reconciliation and peace for me, it's personal. It's personal. So whenever I see this kind of things, not only in Rwanda, but we can mention uh, a lot of African countries, yeah, my heart, my heart breeds. So these are um, some of the statements that support my problem that I'm, I'm, I'm addressing. Um, for example, it's unique in, in this part of the world, Africa, that 25% of our leaders would hang in power and Professor Terence has been dealing with most of them for a long time. And so they have been, they have been in offices for 15 years to 40 years, and they are still comfortable to be there. And so we don't see this anywhere else. So in between, there's a lot of, um, a lot of compromise for peace and, and reconciliation that takes place. And then the amount of poverty that we have in Africa, it's, 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 it's enormous, and a lack of institutions as well. And paradoxically, all these 48 countries of sub-Saharan Africa, um, pretty much they are on the, on the bottom ladder of less developed countries. And so, and despite that fact, we have a lot of resources, natural resources, but we find ourselves there. And when we ask the question why, we return to leadership. And this is just another support to the facts. And so when you look at the GDPs, at least as far as the IMF goes, that's a, um, the International Monetary Fund for 2016, this is how we stood as, as continents. And so as you can see, Africa is on the bottom. Africa is on the bottom. And it's true that 
if I leave this campus, go to teach in Africa, which I planning to do, I wouldn't be able to make more than $1,800. And that would be somebody with a PhD. So middle class in Rwanda would be, as, mu as long as you can have ability to spend $200 per month, and then you're middle class. So it's easy to be middle class in, Ru in Rwanda, in, in Africa, more than any, anywhere else. So this is part of the, the problem that our leaders have put us through. And further supports of uh, my, my reasoning and my problem uh, why I'm interested in this research area is that um, it, it's, it's what has been in 2009 as far as poverty is concerned is still the same fact in 2017. Yeah. And according to the World Bank um, data, the African has been less pretty much when you are comparing the income in Africa, has been 50% less than our brothers and sisters in South Asia, which we pretty much in the 50s, 1950s, we are on the equal, equal footing. And why it is even 7% poorer than Latin America, uh, which is a region which might be more familiar to you here. And so we are asking why. And so we tend to feel that our leaders, maybe they might have taken a wrong path, or they might be journeying uh, through a wrong path. And then, um, as far as life expectancy goes, that's Africa, most of the African countries would be ranging between 50 and 60 there about, which is, which is pretty much compared to South Asia. We're not trying to compare ourselves with the US or with Western Europe. By comparing with Asia, South Asia, uh, 64, we feel we have still a mile to go. And then uh, the infant mortality rate is still high uh, compared to other parts of the world. And so that really pushes us back again to say what are the ty type and quality of leadership that we have as a continent. And so the purpose of this study was really pretty much is to seek to add something on uh, on the body of literature that exists within the scholarship in Africa, but also within the, uh, the, the field of conflict analysis and resolution. And specifically, personally, I believe uh, it is critical to understand um, how the African leaders who have chosen uh, to lead for, for peace and reconciliation, um, how do they manage to do that, I think is, is key for me to be able to, to understand that. And finally, on this slide, 90% um, pretty much of sub-Saharan African nations have experienced the, this kind of uh, sporadic rule or, or kind of uh, violence that we have seen in the past three or four decades. Another purpose of my study is that um, I would like to somehow have a way of making us recognize and understand that creating leaders who will prevent violent conflict or who will seek peaceful resolutions to conflict at various levels, even when it's so difficult, is critical to us. And leaders for peace, such as Mandela, uh, we should be able to really uh, highlight them and should be able to allow them to be taught and mentor us and mentor the young leaders. Then another purpose is, as I was doing my research, there are a couple of things that were coming up that were disturbing. So Barnes says, only leaders come to overcome the abuses of leadership, the previous leadership. And so that has been my reality in Africa. And so, and in Rwanda, leaders come to correct, or oh, go back one step uh, further compared to the previous regime. And Johnny Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership. So I've been thinking this is two way, uh, two way uh, giving too much credit to the leaders. But through my research journey, I think I would like to still contend uh, like them that leadership is pretty much critical. It's at the center of uh, conflict analysis and resolution, uh, peace and reconciliation in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so as I was researching, I was uh, setting out to find out what are the theories uh, of leadership that exist out there that I, we may need to engage. And that might, our leaders have taken some of the models um, for them. And that might be either 
um, a disgrace or a blessing to us. Uh, so the first, three, the first type of leadership or leadership theory that um, um, most of the African uh, heads of states have uh, embraced is the great man theory or the treat or the visionary theory, uh, which tend to to argue that leaders are just born great, so they should be leaders. And no wonder they would stay in the office forever, whether they are performing or not. And then we have charismatic leadership theory, which again says leaders are born charismatic, and so they should be. Also, we have a situational leadership theory which says leader, a leader comes to lead in a particular situation, and so it should be so. And then we have contingent theory, and then we have functional leadership theory, uh, transformation theory, and uh, we have collaboration theory, we have transformation theory, we have adaptive or flexibility or innovative theory, we have servant uh, or ethical leadership, we have effective leadership theory, and then finally at the bottom we have ethical, ethical pragmatism uh, leadership theory, which is the vocabulary that is as, as my committee were pushing me to say, Come on, come, why, what is your leadership theory? How do we call it? And so eventually having gone through all these leadership theories and having gone through my data that I collected through my interviews, I concluded that um, the leadership theory that we need in Africa, and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, the area that I'm engaging is ethical pragmatism leadership. And so, and this leadership is very inclusive, is immoral. It tends to focus more on win-win, which is uh, good for conflict resolution. It can be either individual or communal, but also it can be local or global. But the whole mark of it is uh, it's very ethical and very pragmatic. And so that's the leadership uh, a theory that I'm, I'm, I'm proposing. And so what was my research question? So this was my research, research question. So I just set out to find out what kind of leadership is effective for peace and reconciliation in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that was my curiosity to say, what, what would be this leadership? So that was my question. And so these are some of my interviewees so that are pretty well fascinating and who have been in this field for a really long time. So the first gentleman here, has been assistant to the Sec General Secretary of the uh, United Nations and has been uh, uh, African Union uh, General Sec Secretary for a long time um, and the Prime Minister and the Vice President in Tanzania. So he's, he's pretty known for having to deal with a lot of violence conflicts and a lot of uh, issues in Sub-Saharan Africa. So his name is Salim Mohamed Salim. He's from Zanzibar. And then the other gentleman, is also a veteran in the area and he's known uh, his ethics, you can't question his ethics. He's, um, he's a judge, a justice in Tanzania, but also he has been a prime minister, he has been a vice president, and he has been dealing with a lot of uh, issues in Sub-Saharan Africa. His name is Joseph Warioba. So some, these are were some of the, my, 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 my joy is encountering some of these veterans who have been in the field for a long time. So what were, you might be wondering, what, were, what was my research, um, research method and uh, what was my research design? So mine was the qualitative research design, which was based on grounded theory. And so the grounded theory, pretty much you set out to explore what is there. Uh, so I didn't have any agenda. I just wanted to know what kind of leadership uh, would be best for peace and reconciliation in sub-Saharan Africa. And so that's, uh, that's pretty much the, the, um, the method and that I, I really employed. And so, and this grounded theory allowed me pretty much to just dig, dig out from my interviewees and from the theories that I encountered, it allowed me just to dig in and dig out and see what was there. Um, and so this was the population of, um, that I decided to sample. And so I just, I would ask the people I know, my, I knew myself like Salim, Mohammed Salim, when I was little, we used to look up to him, uh, so I knew him. But also there are a lot of people who are just recommended by uh, colleagues in the field, and this is one of them. Hardly known, the gentleman at the corner. His name is Ari Mfruki, 
and he's not a politician. He's a public sector, a CEO of his own company, but he has donated a lot of money into peace building and is a high proponent of peace and reconciliation. And so um, I, I had the joy to interact with some of this population. But this is how I really chose them. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I. I needed somebody who has been there, who has experience, and also whom I could be able to access. So, and um, within the, the limited time and the resource that I had, I was looking for men and women who could be able to uh, give me what I really needed in that particular time. And this is another gentleman, a very interesting gentleman. Um, his name is... Uh, um, Mpungwe, I'm in Pungwe, uh, was uh, another interview we I had. As you can see, very experienced, uh, an international diplomat, and was dealt with a lot of conflicts. He was the chief mediator uh, for the Rwandan genocide during that particular crisis. Uh, he has mediated a lot of conflicts in sub-Saharan Africa. And so such kind of people uh, kept my, my data growing and kept my uh, study more interesting. So this is how I set out to collect my data and um, my participants, uh, this is how I engaged them. So I pretty much um, reached out to 31 and I was able to uh, interview 20 and 11, I couldn't interview them because of various uh, logistical, um, logistical reasons. Um, and one particularly, one declined at the last moment. So after traveling, uh, after traveling internationally to meet him, I finally said, I think given what my country is going through, uh, this is the reason I was told later, I can't speak to this topic. Um, so. So I conducted pretty much between 60 and 90 minutes face-to-face uh, -face interview. So, um, and with the exception of only two interviewees, uh, whom I interviewed between 35 to 50 minutes thereabout. But the rest were between uh, 60 and 90 minutes. And so that's how I, I did it, um, conducted my interviews. And my introduction would range from how what I have read about them, I had read so much about the, my interviewees, so sometimes I would make a joke about their work or about their experience or anything else that I found that would be more interesting to uh, break the ice for us to begin diving into the really serious conversation about the peace and reconciliation in Sub-Saharan Africa. And my questions, they were pretty much semi structured, so I, I wanted to allow flexibility to be able to really converse with them and get the data that I really needed. Um, and so we had a lot of um, back and, and forth expressions. And being able to, welcome Peter. And so being able to have them face to face, sometimes there are a lot of uh, passions that really were expressed, including at one point, uh, some, well, someone wanting to, to shed tears about um, what they have been doing throughout, and which they feel the regional still need so, to do so much. And so I was able to capture those kind of moments as well. So I would I audio taped all my interviewees and transcribed them. Uh, I have close to 100 single space day. Uh, transcribed the materials from them. And I used InVivo 10 as a software to help me organize my data. Um, and so that was very helpful. And after using InVivo to organize my data, uh, going through close to 100 pages of single space to transcribe the materials, I came up pretty much with this part, which pretty much were four themes. And out of four themes that I came up with, pretty much 90% were telling me about how this leadership should be. And about 10% was about how this leadership should not be. And so moving to data analysis, um, this is what I had to do. I had to, after transcription, I had to clean up all my data. I have to go through a couple of times trying to read and try to eliminate all repetitions. And finally, I had to do some lists. So lists, 
uh, preliminary grouping and then list everything else that uh, uh, was relevant to it and then uh, do reduction and elimination, try to cluster them together and finally I identified pretty much the, the three themes that um, I'll be taking you through. So these are major themes that stood out. So after going through um, um, my data, this is what I pretty much found out to be outstanding. So all my interviewees told me that uh, leadership matters. Leadership matters. And for leadership, I would push back and say, tell me how, what aspect, how does it matter? Tell me a little bit more. And they would say, the first uh, leader has to have a character. Uh, a leader has to have principles that we can see, that we can test, that we can, we can experience. And so all the 20 interviewees are referred to character and moral principles 213 times. And all of them said, a leader need to have solid principles and ethics uh, that would help uh, him or her um, be fair to the followers or to the constituents. And so 19, 19 of them, my, of my interviewees, did say it's very important for a leader to know what is ex he's expected or she's expected to do. Uh, so no is very important. So you can't be a leader for peace and reconciliation if you have nothing to do with peace and reconciliation and if you can't uh, really talk about it. Or oh, use the at least people who know what leadership uh, um, that requires to be able to reconcile people. And I'm glad people like Terence have been journeying back and forth to Africa trying to, to take our leaders through this. And no, it's very important. And then all my interviewees did say yes. Action matters. Yes, you can know, you can have this uh, nice ethical and, and the principal values, but we need to see action. So we need to see the results. And so they are able to say 117 times that yes, the result matters. We need to see the concrete. If you say yes, you want to lead us through peace and reconciliation, show us the results. Show us the results. Finally, the historical background also matters. The history of the leader matters. And so 16 of them of interviewees said yes, this was important and they referred to it um, 75 times. And so trying to just create a visual, um, a visual presentation of these themes, this is how they, they really came out. So at the heart of that center you have a leadership for peace or ethical pragmatism leadership. But that leadership is surrounded or is, um, has contributions from B, from no, from do and from historical background. So the background of the leadership matters, and what they know matters, who they are as persons matters, and what they do matters. So all the interviews concluded that ethical pragmatism was the way to go, and it mattered for the leadership for sub-Saharan Africa if we really want to reconcile and if we want uh, sustainable peace. And the historical background also matters. Uh, that's really very critical, very critical. And so the results that we can see uh, and the taste and the smell matters for that. And so trying to capture what they told me, uh, what would this aspect be, no, do, I mean, and the historical background. And so this is what they, they pretty much uh, came up with. So you have to be able to, to demonstrate your values. They have to be tested. They have to be tested. For example, just, are you just? How about the truth? How about tolerance? How about uh, not being corrupt? How about being, um, um, you know, so... What do you know and what do you do? Uh, so all this, yeah, I had to try and bring this together in this fashion. And so these were my findings again, and my findings continues. And so this leadership, as I tested them, they came in this pretty much in this shape and form. So there are some leaders who would just lead from above, so they don't care about being a, um, being more inclusive, they would just be single-handed men and women, but also they would be ethical and they would be pragmatic. So the results would be the same. And then you have some who would prefer to lead as a team, pretty much engage everyone, so leading from the bottom. Or what I would think would be more communal approach, while the one on the left here would be more individual approach. So either way. Uh, would lead to the same results. Uh, that's what I gathered from my data. 
So what might be the significance of um, my findings uh, as far as peace and reconciliation and leadership and conflict analysis and resolution goes uh, for sub-Saharan Africa? So um, this should be able to facilitate more understanding uh, why leadership matters for peace and reconciliation. Also, it, uh, it has to help to contribute to the growing body of literature within the field. It has to provide both leaders and the followers with more information and information necessary for them to identify uh, the empower, uh, to identify empowering and even challenging leaders when necessary. So uh, this is this is uh, what I think uh, this is contributing and why this is really important to the field. Also, this study will help to understand better and plan better about the policies that affect our field as, as peace builders and, um, and reconciliation uh, builders. It also will help to provide the space for further dialogue on the quality of leadership that we need in Africa to flourish. It also will help us to perform um, a kind of comparison between leaders. So if we have leader one and leader two, we can use uh, ethical pragmatism uh, to assess them and be able to make a comparison and see the results where they stand in terms of the results. So ethical pragmat pragmatic leadership may also develop, uh, grow, and make a difference for as far as sustainable peace development and reconciliation goes for the Africa and the Sub-Saharan Africa particularly. So what were the, my limitations? I had a lot of limitations. One was the geographical area that I was covering. So Sub-Saharan Africa is big, 48 countries. And so uh, that was, was a lot of uh, readings to, to do. But also it was too small. So here I am coming up with the theory, pragmatic leadership, um, ethical pragmatic leadership theory, concluding based on that. So. That was one of the limitations. My area is too big, but also it's too small compared to entire Africa or compared to the rest of the globe. Um, my study methodology as well uh, could have been uh, based since I'm from Africa, I'm from Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm, I was studying the phenomena that I've grown up with, so that might have a kind of um, a personal um, touch on that. In some cases, uh, participants uh, also allocated inadequate time for me uh, to be able to uh, get all the dat data I needed. And then also my interview, the 20 interviewees, I wish I had uh, 10 more or 20 more that uh, I would not necessarily in involve in my, or including my research findings, but which I could just use for myself to compare and make sure that I've um, circulated all my data that I could find. And then in lack of um, equal presentations or a representation within the study itself, I felt that it deprived, uh, def deprived me personally, but also deprived my readers um, what could have been the joy of Having 10 men and 10 women, how would that data look like? So since I had 95% of, of my, my interviews were men and only five were women. And so the recommendations, what am I recommending? Um, I'm recommending that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and its partners should, should be able to evaluate the policies uh, that invest in top level leadership uh, using ethical pragmatism as a yardstick. So we should be able to use that. And for the ethically followers um, and those who seek leadership positions, should consider four themes is uh, to is a yardstick again to measure their results. So, and then based on historical context, be, know, and do, they should be able to at least together ask themselves whether they are making a difference or not. So, if a leader is in the office, should be able to say. Am I making a difference? Am I making life better or worse? And then um, and we should be able to say how to build somehow kind of muscles that would attribute to the values and the character, to the results, to the knowledge that we wish to see within the sub-Saharan African leadership. Sub-Saharan Africa also should, countries should also be able to increase the number of women in the top level leadership. Since I was studying the top level leadership, I think um, no wonder I ended up with only 2%, so instead of, no 5% instead of uh, 50%. So I think it's a challenge for Sub-Saharan African countries and particularly challenge to me as, as, um, as a scholar to be able to increase that number. There should be more investment in promoting ethical pragmatism 
pragmatic leadership, especially, uh, especially with the children and education. So there's a gentleman in Africa, Mo Abraham, who has a project of rewarding fi five million to African leaders, heads of state, who retire gracefully after doing a good job. I think some of this money, I think I'm going to write him in personal, should go to actually targeting the young ones um, as they grow up. Sub-Saharan African countries need to deliberately increase women also on the top level leadership, given that that's where really the policies and the politics um, get, get be, be decided that influences the rest of our lives. And then um, finally, um, again, looking at the, how the policies, politics and the powers interplay within the peace um, and reconciliation, violence, conflict, genocide, uh, and even democracy and development, I think we should be able to say yes. We need to increase the number of, um, of women but also, not only women, but also men who, are, who can be ethical and pragmatic, um, not only at the individual level, but also at the institutions, our institutions. So my conclusions, um, this would be my conclusion, and it might be getting tired. So what I learned in this, in this whole research is that uh, there's, there's, there's interaction, there's interaction between ethics and the pragmatism. So the, the synergistic interaction between ethics and leadership that, and pragmatism came out uh, outstandingly uh, from my interviews and from my data. And then um, without having that kind of uh, synergistic inter interaction somehow, leadership lacks something within the African context and within the sub-Saharan African context. And so that interaction has to keep going. And so this is, um, this is what leads me to conclude that um, maybe my next chapter or what might be my next step or what might be my next question that I needed to address is how to promote and teach ethical pragmatic leadership and how to um, make it engage not only um, only the top level leadership about all the leadership levels. Um, and I need this would be one of the way I'd be doing it, holding symposiums and teaching leaders, the community leaders and various groups, but also children, uh, children, uh, teach them to be critical thinkers. And in most of the African context, and particularly Rwanda, even the genocide happened because uh, the leader said we should kill and we kill. So I think we should reverse that. We should teach our kids to ask questions why. We should uh, teach our communities uh, to ask questions why. Why should I do that? And then also from the techniques and the practices and all the skills that I've acquired and that I continue to acquire, I think I should take that to the next level. So, and as I continue to grow in wisdom, I think um, I would like to continue doing that. So the first lady here is Susan um, Mark Colin. She's the Vice President of Search for Common Ground, a very known or oh, known uh, NGO that does peace building around the globe. She's, she's, uh, she was one of my interviewees. She does incredible work. So I'd like to see growing and become like her, oh, training men and women who could become like her if I can't become like her. And then on the other side, I have my chair here. Uh, she does incredible work, not only in the classroom, but also around the, around the globe in many countries. And so this is what I see myself uh, taking on as the next step. So with that, I think I've spoke too much. I should keep my mouth shut. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I would love to turn to the committee for, for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. For reading it and uh, reading your thesis and writing for me. Um, my question would be for the leadership. Um, first of all, can you uh, uh, would you provide a definition of the ethical pragmatistic styles of practice? Thank you. Thank you for your question. So I would define the ethical pragmatic uh, pragmatism leadership as the leadership 
which is both ethical and both practical. And as I did demonstrate in one of the, the, the slides, um, this could be either individual or it could be communal, could be individual, could be the team. So the, the main uh, underlying definition for me would be the combination of between ethics and pragmatism. So being able to say, am I ethical, but also am I practical, given the situations and the circumstances. So that's, that's how I would, uh, I would look well, at it. Absolutely, most of the time would be in conflict. But leadership that we need, this leadership that can make that tough decisions when there is a conflict uh, to be uh, to be grappled with. So, I think I heard you say pragmatist style and ethical style could come into conflict. How are they integrated here? The, the integration, uh, the conflict, maybe, yes, I should I add a little bit more on conflict is. Um, from my data, uh, some would favor more of inclusive, and that's one aspect, but also the universal. So the uh, ethical uh, definitions would tend to be more universal, and some would be more specific, so they wouldn't be universal. There you go, within my data, there's a, that, that aspect of conflict. So what would be the meeting point, or what would be the, the point of reconciliation between these two would be the purpose of why they're doing what they're doing. So if the purpose is peace and reconciliation, and then at this particular point, should we approach it from the universalistic uh, moral point of view or individualistic moral point of view? And so the purpose itself would be able to guide us uh, to what should be the, reconcil the reconciling point. So if peace and reconciliation is our desire and is our aim, and then uh, in between, um, suggesting this is a continuum, or it's a, it's a continuum. So Given either ethical or pragmatic, uh, it's both. So you, you are ethical. By ethical, sometimes it would conflict. You would be more universal, and sometimes it would be more individualistic. Uh, but the, the and the whole aim you are trying to be practical given the situations, and so the meeting point becomes the peace. The meeting point becomes the reconciliation. So the leaders who should be able to ask themselves at this point, given my morals and my ethics, and given what is practical, and so what should I do? What should my community do? What should the country do to address or to reach peace and reconciliation? So yeah, it's the tension that has to be there. Conflicts are more dynamic, and so these two terms, ethics and pragmatism, should be equally dynamic to be able to um, move according to the context. You, um, you use the be no do model, yeah. which is from the uh, military, as you referenced in your, um, it's, it's in the military manuals. Um, the B has to do with the character, right? And, yes. Um, the no are the skills, yeah. the competencies, uh, large or small. Yeah. One of the things I noticed there was that, um, well, in the B part, so we've been talking in leadership literature about motivation to lead or motives to lead and those kinds of things. I didn't see that anywhere in the B part, which I think would be a critical part of the uh, um, Leaderable occupancy in these. Um, so um, it, it, the leadership is a value in some sense as well. But well, let me take that back. Yeah. <clears throat> to lead or to want to lead is a value that drives from this. In the no part, you have um, a number of, of competencies and skills that have been mentioned in the literature, but I did not see any social competencies. Uh, but in your description later in the chapter, later in the dissertation, you elaborated a number of these. I can find it quickly. Um, you had in there active listening and communication. Um, yeah, you had um, a lot of help and lead, exhibit good interpersonal communication skills, active listening and empowering others. It seems that the no should also have the social capacities. Thoughts, thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, again, this this was uh, was not uh, conclusive, so I think the list is to keep being added. Uh, you're right. Yeah, that uh, motivation to lead should be should be added. Uh, common sense, prudence should be added, and it would be part of my 
what will be the next step. So as I continue to interact with the veterans in the field like you and the work, yeah, I should, I should add to this list and I've taken them down and added them up. But you did, based on this, you did hear these themes in your interviews? Absolutely, they came up. They yeah, they came up, yeah. Especially on uh, ethics, yeah, question like prudence. In my interviews, I had uh, three bishops and always they say the leader needs to have a common sense, the leader needs to have prudence, the leader needs to be able to uh, really know what the leadership is, uh, which, 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 uh, which is uh, part of no. So, yeah, thank you. I'll add them up. I told you to do the poem. Um, there's quite a bit of the ethical leadership literature. And I had a student who actually did a dissertation on this. And he spoke about moral communication. And Trevino and uh, uh, who major people in ethical leadership and management talked quite a bit about moral communication. Um, it seemed so. Have you did you did you, did you uncover anything in your interviews about moral communication? Communication is part of it's it's, um, it's a part of uh, the techniques and the practices within the field of conflict analysis and resolution. And it, yes, I would agree. And it did come up that uh, a leader, we most of the time when they moving towards violence. Their communication changes, the tone changes vis a vis when they're communicating for peace. Well, let me, let me um, be more specific. Yeah. The communication about moral standards, about moral uh, uh, behavior, about moral norms, it's, it's a morally focused on ethics, those are communication. Anything on that? I would think communication, yes. Communication matters, and the communication can be, if is for peace and reconciliation, it would be ethical. And if it's for violence, most of the time it would not. Um, so that's how I think it came, it came across in my interviews. So when the politicians stand there, they say, go and do this, or don't do this, and then that communication could be ethical, could be unethical, could be pragmatic, or could be unpragmatic. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, one final comment. Um, you, you talked about communal leadership. Yes. So there is a growing literature on collective leadership. That you might, um, in fact, some of I think some of the better papers that you came out since your uh, proposal. So uh, um, it was after you had set things up, but um, there's a growing sense that in complex systems, like countries and organizations, leadership is often shared, and there are different patterns of shared leadership. So I wonder if you had saw any of those themes in there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, the community leadership. Uh, the first models that uh, tended to say great man and and um, and the treats uh, which you have written extensively on, uh, they seem not to be holding at this at, at this point in time, given the complexity of the the countries and the complexity of globalization. So most of the the uh, interviewees would say yes, we need a leader, and I think in my 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 dissertation, we need a leader who can who can interact with other leaders, who can interact with the followers, who can interact with the constituents. So the, the collective leadership might be the next step uh, within, within the, the wider uh, sense of leadership. So there's no any leader who can know it all, and who can do it all, and who can be all, and who can have the entire country or entire continent context. So you need the other shared context. You need other shared knowledge. You need other shared experience and work. So that's true, yeah. Uh, I should expand on this. Another, which means another part of the do, part of the leadership, is, is fostering leadership in others. And you mentioned servant leadership as a key framework for your approach to this. And that was a key that was the underlying key theme of the servant leadership uh, approach. The, the, um, the marker for leadership effectiveness and servant leadership is the fact that other people are leading yeah. after you uh, work with them. So uh, I think that needs to be part, another part of the do part of your life. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree that um, within my mentorship, uh, that I should have said a little bit more on the mentorship, but that's the role of the mentor. Mentor being able to say, yes, I've been there, 
and so I can encourage other people to go there. I don't have to hang on power for 20 years or for 40 years. I can mentor other leaders to take uh, the leadership uh, tasks and the positions. So yeah, sure, I should add that part on the do. Thank you. So Innocent, congratulations. You've done a, um, a yeoman's job with trying to make sense out of all the things that you that you collected. Thank you. I, um, I want first to acknowledge that you, I think you did exactly right. You went to Africa and found out what leaders in Africa say about how you do good leadership as opposed to taking the Western model and imposing those criteria. So I think that's really an important part of this. And I like your model, and I'll, I've given you some suggestions on it. I think if you could go back to the one that has ethical pragmatism. Ethical pragmatism. Circles with, it's in your findings. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. So I'm, of course, you should be surprised, troubled by the fact that you were only able to find one woman, <laughs> and that the woman you found was Susan uh, Collins Mark, because she actually lives here. And um, so that just then raises the question, why can we not find women leaders in Africa that had, would have something to do with us? And I'm, I know there are lots of answers to that. But let's assume that you couldn't find any other than one out of your 20. Then what, what's missing in this model? that would be gender-based? Or maybe a better question is, how is gender part of this model when a big voice around what would make a good leader in Africa is missing in the model? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good and a complex question. Um, I did interview two ladies. Uh, one is Susan Corin. Uh, who lives here, but she lives everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and she's originally from South Africa. And she was part of Mandela transition team. Uh, she did a lot of peace building on the ground, training the police chief and military and communities to somehow embrace the new vision of the country, which was a reconciliation. And so the second uh, lady I interviewed is our Rwandan ambassador here in the US. And she has been doing extensive work with the communities before becoming an ambassador, uh, before becoming a diplomat. And so why didn't I find more? I, it, it's my cry. I wish I had more. I tried to reach out to many, and that should be part of my, my uh, next step to encourage more women. I think we have more encouraged men to uh, come out and speak about their experience and expertise in this than po po possibly we have promoted women to do that. Um, so that is my, one of my, my mea culpa and I think as a sub-Saharan Africa we should do more. But coming back to your second question which is the key voice which is missing of w women, I think I would, do, I would not try to categorize these values and experiences and work uh, within the male female. I uh, would love the female experience, maybe the background aspect, but coming to do, coming to know, coming to be, the ethical values that we carry uh, cut us across the, the gender base. So a woman who is, who is a just is good as a man, who is, a man who is a just. And a woman who is expertise in this particular discipline is as good as a man. So, and a woman who is passionate about peace and peace building and reconciliation is good as a man. So I would tend to uh, lift away from trying to pull that into uh, that division, but I would be more eager, especially coming from Rwanda, where most of our parliamentarians are women and have made a tremendous difference in the politics, how the politics and, and the policies are crafted. I would be really more interested to add more voices of women. And as I step, as I step out, I think I'll be able to, to go and try to find more women, maybe for my next, uh, whatever next is going to be, an article or a chapter in a book, capturing the voices of women who are missing here. 
uh, and whose voices are critical. But as far as the values goes, and as far as the experience in knowledge and, and, and action, I think women and men uh, tend to have, uh, to have, they can have the same, the same results as far as peace and reconciliation is concerned. And we have seen that in African context. Women, the Liberian women, Without them, maybe Liberia could not have reached peace. And so the work done by you and Susan around the globe, so the work done by Susan and Alan, so all those voices within the African context, I think, should be able to future as well and surface. Good, but I'm not going to let you off the hook on that. I mean, it seems to me that if you've got a model that you think that you that you want to be offering to the conflict resolution literature in terms of promoting good leadership, then and you've got lots of women in Africa who are doing really amazing things in Africa, and you've got lots of bar barriers there for women to have their voice. So that when you do a snowball effect, it's sort of like who you're going to interview those names don't come up. Um, it, it seems to me that maybe the cultural piece is missing there in your model, like in the, in the context. Maybe you could add that to your mm -hmm. historical background or yeah. some place in there. That, so that if you look at the work that we did in the research on a number of African countries and deconstructing um, women, security, and peace, what you know, all of the, the last decades of work with women, what we found is that the barriers were just so profound in terms of people's attitudes towards if they could be a leader. So in the, in the education piece of that, it, it would be essential that you have a gender uh, theme in that. So my recommendation is that I think your model, you're onto a really good idea on your model, but that there has to be some explicit piece to say what we don't know yet is What are the gendered issues? I mean, this this is a very this might be just a very male model, yeah. and it might not be. I mean, we don't know that. Or what pieces of this is a very male model? Yeah. I mean, does does a woman have ethical a moral voice in a culture where they're silenced? So it's it's that kind of I think really important piece of this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's an excellent excellent point. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the cultural part. Um, I, I want to give you some avenues to, to think about. One is the Globe Leadership Study, which mm -hmm. looked at leadership styles across many, many countries. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, and, and uh, it's, it may be a little outdated by now, because it was uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, you may check in there. There's two large books and several articles about the Globe Study and see if they looked at male and female differences in the leadership styles they looked at. Um, if you if you also get familiar with Hofstede's book, H H O F S T E D E, he created um, culture scores around power distance, individuals and collectivism, I think masculinity and feminine maybe one of them, a whole bunch of these, which I think goes to your point about how what are people's attitudes about women leaders? And finally, the work of Alice Eaton, who was a pioneer in this area of women in leadership, mm. who first, back in the 80s, I think, even earlier, talked about how women leaders and men and, men, and, and leaders are perceived differently and what that means for um, follow attitudes and follow attribution. I think they, they go to a part of providing a foundation for how you move forward. But I was struck by that. There were only two female leaders, and, and you didn't, weren't able to get into the differences. But you know, if the ethical, pragmatic leadership is going to be called a style, what happens when men versus women practice that style in terms of influences on followers? And that will bring you to the literature. Yeah, that, that's a that's an excellent point from from both of you. Yeah, and it's. It's, it's important that some of the women I approached to interview ended up referring me to men. I think that's where the culture comes in. So this is a really excellent point that I needed to address. Um, the, the cultural um, nuances. That's part of breaking that. I mean, you, you even indicate that in here, that women need to be more forthcoming. And probably the women who said that they're going to refer you to men know that it's a trap that they're not going to get into. So it's better off to just 
interview again. So they're they're operating on those cultural assumptions. Yeah. And so how do you break or intervene on those kinds of cultural assumptions where in fact they have a voice that's really important here? Yeah, absolutely, I agree. This is a really good point, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay, that's a, that's a great point I, that might add to my model. I had one other, um, just because I like frameworks, but I also know the limitations of frameworks. Yeah. Um, your frameworks, in the presentation, I'm sorry that folks didn't see the other frameworks that you have in there. Yeah. You've got variables that inform what are some, some variables for B and some variables for do and so on. And in those, they are depicted as if they're all equal. But some of them are more profound than others. And I'm wondering if you, you could even um, make them larger and smaller, or say, based on, the, on what you got with your sample. Because you do have numbers in your yeah. in your sample, So, but your your frameworks don't reflect that. And I think that would be something that I tried to tinker with, and I just totally messed up your framework. So <laughs> I'll leave that to the techies. <laughs> Well, that, that's a good point. I think with Invivo, that's the advantage of using Invivo as a software. It, it makes it easier to uh, shrink them or to enlarge them. So yeah, I agree. Uh, there's some that are outstanding and that that are higher than than others in terms of. Uh, so my uh, final question to you at this point, anyway, is um, so what? What are you going to do with this? What that's great. What, what, what am I going to do? I, th I think I'll be setting out to pretty much advocate and teach about this uh, uh, framework and about this mode of leadership. That's pretty much what I'll be doing. I'm already engaged with the communities, a lot of, uh, do a lot of community work in Rwanda. Uh, but I would, so I would like to grow this, uh, not only in the community, but also in academia, and uh, push it a little bit to see if it could, uh, could be another lens in which we can evaluate our leadership, not only at the top level, but also at all other levels, so grassroots and middle uh, range of leadership. And the advantage will be the both the top level leadership and those who are being led will be having a common understanding and a common expectations on which they can judge each other. So, and I hope that might engineer good results for peace and reconciliation and development as well. So we have graduates from here that are in Rwanda, like Peace, Wednesday, you know, Peace. Yeah. She works in the legislature to increase women, so that would be a good kind of person. Thank you. Yeah, I'll reach out to her. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. I uh, would like to ask you, in a sense, as you step back and look at this as a whole now, because we've been deep in the weeds of each chapter and so forth. Um, to look at the whole of what you're offering um, with ethical, pragmatic leadership, um, how does this then relate back to uh, the conflict resolution and leadership literature that you've cited? What is the main contribution that your model makes? What, what have we learned from, from these African leaders uh, and their experience of leadership? What, what does that say to the literature in terms of areas where the literature works for these African leaders and areas where the literature is different than the wisdom these African leaders have shared with us? Yeah. Well, that, that will be the, the question that will take me throughout my entire life uh, to come. But what would this really mean is that as a field, we have focused on other uh, techniques and the practices and the solutions for conflicts, but we have not invested much in any leadership, in terms of especially on top level leadership. And I think what my research does and my, the wisdom from my, my interview is to say, we can't ignore our leadership. So leadership is, is key, is, is, is a, is, it's at the center of conflict resolution. And so I focused in this research on top, top level leadership, given its power and given the, the ability to make policies and the politics that causes us, either push us into conflict or into violence, into wars, into genocide, or into peace. Also, we could focus on middle-level leadership. We could focus on uh, grassroots leadership. So as a field of conflict analysis and resolution, I think we should make a little bit more investment in looking into leadership. 
So if we are trying to treat the, the symptoms, maybe one of the symptoms we should be really treating is top wave leadership and then middle wave leadership and low or grassroots leadership. Uh, being able to empower the grassroots and the middle to question these guys above. But also being able to demonstrate and dramatize these guys above and say, this is what you should be doing, but this is what you are doing. This is the yardstick which we can measure your results, your values, your knowledge, uh, your expertise in using the the, the available knowledge and expertise that you are not using. So, yeah, that will be, I think, a contribution to the field. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Uh, so, can we turn to other folks in the room who may have questions for us? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, what I find remarkable about what you did is that this went way beyond an academic study in many respects. Uh, it gave you, I think, probably will be a life philosophy that you'll, you'll carry with you all the rest of your life and shape what you do when you go back to Rwanda and many people that you influenced and will influence. You know. So that's, I mean, that's what I find compelling about this, you know? I mean, a lot of times it gets put on a shelf. This, this is something that'll guide you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Greg and his family, uh, it is his daughter and Sandy, his wife, they have been part of my moving uh, forward. They are fine believers of uh, Africa solving the problems, and they have traveled to Africa a couple of times. Um, and that's true, as you did mention, this is, this is going to go beyond uh, this presentation and beyond the leadership that I teach in the classroom. But this will be my life project, uh, pretty much. I, given my own history and my own context, um, I believe with better leadership, Africa, and Africa can be better. Um, and so I deeply agree with you that this is going to be my uh, lifelong project. So I'll be researching on this topic and writing on this topic for maybe next uh, whatever life I have. So, yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, so you're looking at top level leadership, and my question is how does this model translate to like? You know, the Museveni's and the Rashid's of you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, how, does, how do you see this model impacting their leadership or their position in power? Like, do you see what you're saying here? Is it, how, how is it going to change leadership in Africa on that presidential level? Yeah. About that, or if you have a Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So about 10% of my results were what the leadership should not be, so it's not included in this, given that it was not part of my research. But I have about 10% of my data that says leadership should not be this. And I think that's where you would put them, seven is in the, in the Ali Bashir. But the, what this model would be able to do is to really say to them, this is what we expect you as, as your followers or your constituents, and this is what you, you are not doing. And so this model will be able to pretty much communicate to them what we know that they should be doing, or they should know, or they should be, which they are not. And if they want to improve, they can they have a choice. They can improve, or they can sync with their own with their own uh, powers. So, yeah, but they'll be able to say yes. This is what we know. The rest of us we know. If you, in case you thought that we don't know, this is what we know. In case you didn't know yourself, this is uh, what you would improve. So, yeah. Thank you, Innocent, for that research, which is very impressive. And my question is about the four model, the four pillars of your model, because for me it's easy to know what a person is, especially in Africa when you want to elect, for example, a president or any leader, and it's easy to check his or her background, but there is one problem. Yeah, we can also know if he or she knows, but don't do is kind of problematic on my side because you can't know what somebody is able to do unless he or she does it. We do you fear that this situation can lead our leaders to stick on power as we see in many some 
Saharan African countries because the only people that we know who were able to achieve something or to do something tangible are already leaders. Will they stick on power or do you think that there is a, a way you can overturn this problem? Well, that's a, that's a complex question, Vinny. Asking from Burundi and context. Uh, but here is what, uh, what I would say. One is, going back to the historical context, there is no any leader who comes at the top without having a history. But sometimes we tend to ignore the history. So if uh, he or she is seeking higher office, we should be able to say, tell us what you have done in life. Tell us what you haven't done. Tell us what we can see that we can witness that actually you are capable of leading us to this leadership we seek at this point in time. And so I would think that on the part of B and do, they are really they're intertwined. So if the B part, which is the moral and the character part, so if the, you have no proper ethics that can govern your behavior and your actions, and then I think you are bound to fail with the do. And if you really have right them here, and then you are likely to succeed, succeed with the do. So I would not think that this model would actually encourage them to be in the office for a long time and die there. But I think you would rather call them to self-examination uh, to see where do they stand in relation to their constituents, in relation to their followers, and what we know for them to be responding to the question that uh, matter to us, which is peace and reconciliation. So I think this model would be a kind of mirror to them and say this is, look at yourself and so where are you? Are you worth to be in this office or are you good if you went? So, yes, Claudine. Okay. My question is about the implementation of this model. We know from, most of us are from Africa, we know that in the African context, power corrupt, especially if you're in power for a while, you tend to kind of stay in power, you bring your kids, your family, and power tends to corrupt in a lot of countries in Africa, especially in East Africa. So you're going to present the model to the leaders, but how are you going to assess the implementation of the model? How are you going to actually convince them that they should be ethical and they should follow the model for the while being of their own people, knowing that a lot of people don't really care about that? Corina, that's a, that's a good question and an excellent question. Um, most of the African leaders have tended, this is how they have tended to define themselves from my research that I've been reading a lot about them. I count first my interest and my family's interest and my tribe and my ethnic real group interest. And then my party, whatever political party comes, that comes the second in the hierarchy of responding to the needs of the people, the constituents and the followers. And then the country can come the third, or the entire community can come the third. And so back to this implementation, you'll be able to say, looking back into 40, 50 years ago, where these countries have been, um, including a lot of wars and genocides, do we, as a leader, do you want to lead your country there again? We as the followers, should we allow you to lead us there again? So I think this is going to call accountability on both, the, both levels, the leader himself, also the followers. So me being a follower, am I willing to say, no, you can't lead me there again? Or am I willing to say, yes, I close my eyes. As long as I belong to your tribe or I belong to your family, and then I can enjoy the privileges and then let the rest go to hell. So I think this will be, it'll be calling, at the level of implementation, it will be calling accountability on two levels. One, on the level of leadership itself, but also another accountability on the level of the followers, being able to say, yes, we know what we, we should expect, and so we, we can't allow you to take us back to where we have been and where we have not been comfortable. So take us where we are comfortable, take us where we want to go. If you don't know the way, then step aside, somebody else can come in and lead us there. So, yeah. Comment. Yes. That's probably a piece in your conclusion discussion around the implication this has for your um, what conflict resolution people should need to do with the followers, quote unquote, and the, the, the people. Do you organize? Because you, you, one of your findings was the education is important both for the leaders and the followers. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to play that up more. 
yeah. because I think she's onto something that unless there's a, a big cultural shift, you're going to continue with the corruption and the power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point that I should include, yeah. Um, and I'm a funny believer, a funny believer of education. There's no way we can ever pull out ourselves from all this messy political and economic and cultural messy if we are not educated or if we don't educate our kids. So I, I think yeah, being able to educate critical mind, uh, that would be crucial for implementation of this model. And it's something that I'm, I'm personally invested to doing. And uh, I can't wait for you to come and join me and, and push this model forward as we transform our countries. And yeah, thank you for your presentation. It's, it's amazing. Uh, but I, I include also community education. We, we may think that education is a classroom education. We, we need to educate the community how they, they know their, what, what the government or the leaders should be doing. I know growing up in Rwanda, the people do not face their leaders, but currently the, the people in Rwanda, they can call. They can call in the president's office, say our mayor is, is messing up. They can, if police is asking to corrupt them, they can call in the police office. So that's how community education can, can help people to know and to ask responsibility for, and be accountable for their, their leaders. Not only including the classroom, but only going, how do you implement this model? You may think about how you have graduates movement and education. Yeah, thank you, Didas. Um, I agree. Community education is most of the time what I do when I'm in Rwanda. I do community organizing. And the community organizing is about education. And the part of what I do is train the communities, the villagers, to hold their leadership accountable. So I would train the villagers to call the mayor. How do you call the mayor? How do you sit with the mayor? How do you sit with the minister? How do you call the minister? How do you seek the appointment with the minister? So I agree the community education is vital, especially for the grassroots and for the civil society, uh, strengthening in civil society, yes. Community education has to be. And there is a, a man there in, and his wife, Peter, and, and Sherry, his wife, they have been a fine support of me traveling always. If I need to travel to Rwanda for this work, they always say, OK, go. So yeah, so the community education, yes, I've been there. And I continue to do that. Sort of underlying a lot of this research is an interesting question about what makes a leader choose to be ethical versus choose not to be ethical as a leader. The framework and construction of ethical pragmatism indicates that there's a practical reason. The practical reason is often rooted, therefore, in benefits of ethics for people or personal benefit, which relates back to the question of power. So if you're going to be trying to sell this model, um, one of the things as practitioners that we are always constantly seeking is identifying the self-interest of those party, of the people that we're working with, to listen to us and to engage in. So my questions are sort of a two-parter piece. One is, what is it the advantage of such a leader to become more of an ethical pragmatist? And where in this model is their power that they can then use in order to be able to become such an ethical leader, and just for fun, is there an inverse side of flipping this model and seeing if it matches an other? <coughs> and part two, have you noticed in the findings of and the interviews that perhaps each one of these forms of models, being, knowing, doing, and historical background, each one of those has components of power in them. Are the ethical pragmatist leaders engaging in those forms of powers in particular ways? Do they, is there sort of a, a kind of a personality that gets drawn to being a, a doer leader versus a knowing leader, versus someone who's drawing on their historical background leader? And if so, what, and something to think about for the future, what are the implications of those in those contexts and situations? And do you see that currently, or is that something that you are going to be thinking about for the future? 
Excellent questions. Yes, uh, to begin with the last one, yes, I'll be thinking about this and I'll be engaging this. And I think I've written a little bit more into my dissertation about this. Um, but self-interest, yes. Every leader has self-interest and every, every constituent or follower has self-interest. And there's nothing wrong with that to begin with. So, so self-interest is good. But self-interest should be able to meet somehow. So the leadership, self-interest, and the followers, self-interest, should be able to meet somewhere. And so being able to acknowledge the self-interest from the followers or from the constituents, but also the leadership being able to, we as the followers being able to say yes, what are the interests of leadership? So at the top, they want to succeed, they want to look good, they want to have enough resources, um, well and good. How about the followers, what do they want? So I would, yes, I would say, think that at the heart of each of this aspect is the component of power. And that power would be, should it be power over, or should it be power with, or should we count power into, or should we talk about the power within? So I think the model is suggesting the power within or power into. So all of us have self-interest. Can we allow that self-interest to flourish, all of us? We shouldn't talk about power over where the leader has power over the rest of, of the constituents. But should we be able to say the constituents having the power to call the leader out? And so uh, based on their own self-interest. So I, I would agree, yes. There's implication, there's power, there's interest, and I'd be, yeah, I'd be looking to all that. So I think at this point, um, I will ask the committee to uh, what? Yeah, yeah. The committee will step out um, and have its deliberations, and um, invite you all to enjoy the refreshments that are that are back in the corner there. And we'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, with some uh, conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.